Today is Thursday, September 13th, 2018. I'm at the Atlanta History Center with Eric Erickson in Atlanta, Georgia for the two-party Georgia Oral History Project sponsored by the Richard Russell Library at the University of Georgia. How are you, Eric? Good, how are you? Good, doing really well. Um, if it's okay, we'll just jump right in. Sure. Um, I want to start talking about to, with um, talking about your uh, just how you grew up, you know, and where you're from, mm -hmm. and um, how you ended up in Macon, Georgia, and stayed. <laughs> <laughs> um, stayed, never left. Right. So you were born in Jackson, Louisiana. Yes, uh, okay. I was born in Jackson, Louisiana, in the 1975, and in 1980, uh, my dad worked for Conoco Oil, and they basically told him move to Dubai or find a new job. So mm -hmm. we packed up and moved there until 1990. Uh, we would come home during the summer, um, moved back to Louisiana in June of 90, right before the Gulf War started. The, it was clear we were headed in that trajectory and my dad's company wanted to move everybody home just in case. Mm -hmm. uh, finished in public school in rural Louisiana and had suffered through the David Duke Edwin Edwards race and knew I did not want to stay in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. my, did you work on anything in that race? No, I didn't. Okay. I worked for Clyde Holloway, one of the, the Republican congressmen in the area, just in high school, kind of volunteer, interested in politics, mm -hmm. and, but did not work on that race. My parents, good Republicans, had the vote for the crook, it's important, sticker on their car. <laughs> and I just, the fact that Louisiana could some, come so close to electing a Klansman at the time, I was like, I, I don't want to stay here. Right. I uh, got a scholarship to go to Duke and was headed off to Duke until my mother convinced me I needed to go see this little Baptist school in Georgia called Mercer. Mm -hmm. uh, they were far nicer than the people at Duke and wound up staying. Uh, went to Mercer, 93 to 97, stayed for law school. What did you major in? Uh, political science and history. Okay. And moved off to law school, uh, total political law school track with those degrees. Mm -hmm. And met my wife and stayed, was working for Saxby Chambliss. Uh, he helped me get a job at a law firm with one of his friends. I hated practicing law, but which we, firm? A uh, cell in Melton in Macon, and we just kind of stayed, put our roots down. Did um, backing up just a bit, where you um, you said that you were um, your parents were Republicans and. And Louisiana, I bet that was lonely in the 80s. Well, you know, it's kind of funny. They were registered Democrats, but they had, like so many people in the South, had begun making the shift where on local races still voted Democrat, but more and more federally were voting Republican, voted for Reagan. I think my dad had voted for Carter mm -hmm. and then voted for Reagan and never voted Democrat again. Do you remember having those conversations growing up about their transition at all? Not a whole lot. Uh, my dad's father was a union organizer in Miami, Florida. My dad is 100% Swedish, born and raised in Pearl okay. Gables, Florida. Uh, and, and he tells the story of how his father made all of the boys, my, my grandfather was in a wheelchair, and he made all of his kids go into the voting booth and vote for Lyndon Johnson, claiming he needed help to vote, mm -hmm. uh, making sure they voted Democrat before he <laughs> voted. And uh, my dad was not then politically active after that until the, the 70s and 80s, having kids and a family and mm -hmm. fundraise for the Boy Scouts before working for an oil company. And my mom was just, uh, her dad was the mayor of their town in World War II in rural Louisiana and Democrat. And mm -hmm. just over time, they were culturally, socially conservative and moved Republican. Gotcha. And in college, you were politically active. Yes, I was. Uh, I, growing up in Dubai, uh, it was very, very hot, and I was not an athlete. I was not going to play football in 100-degree heat uh, in the sand. So <laughs> I, politics kind of became my way to connect. Uh, in Dubai? In, yeah, in Did Dubai. you get into local politics in Dubai? No, well, it was, it, it was all American politics. In 1998, right. or 1988, I was in eighth grade, and we did the entire school year. Every class was in some way devoted to the American presidential election between Bush and Dukakis. And... I got to be uh, Dan Quayle in the debate, uh, and I, I was George Bush in mine. Nice, yeah, <laughs> and it was it was a fun experience. I really liked politics and got into it. So when I moved home, wanted to work in politics in some way. Of course, it was Louisiana; it was weird. Mm -hmm. uh, but moved to Georgia and started the College Republicans at Mercer. Oh, wow. and became the chairman of the State College Republicans, uh, the last chairman of the Georgia Federation of College Republicans and the first chairman of the Georgia Association of College Republicans, then went to law school and was working for... Who were you, who were your, your Democratic counterparts in the, in, the, in the Young Democrats of Georgia at the time? Do you remember? I have no idea. I'd never so met There were them. a bunch of people that, were, that went through that program. Mm -hmm. Mercer, it had apparently had had a College Republicans for... 
a couple of years and mm -hmm. it died and there was no history of who all was involved. And I got a random phone call from somebody at UGA asking if I would restart the, the organization. That was right when, I mean, the, the South was changing. Saxby Chambliss looked like he was going to win against Craig Mathis in 94 and mm -hmm. got involved in that campaign and then started the College Republicans and rounding up volunteers to go door to door and help him win. Is that what all you did on that campaign was just, you did field stuff for him? <laughs> so yeah, I did a lot of field and, and organizational outreach. It, it was a somewhat nimble campaign in 94. And I did a lot of organizational outreach to the Christian coalition and the gun rights groups. And, mm -hmm. and then I wound up being tech support. No one in the office could figure out how to fix his computers. <laughs> and and I, I, I was an Apple guy who knew Windows machines and mm -hmm. could fix all the computers in the office. So even early, that far back, the, the, um, evangelical wing of the party was your lane. You felt like that right. was your lane at that age. Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was reaching out to pro-life groups and gun groups was mm -hmm. something they had someone who was much more dedicated to that. Then in 96, it became a much more nimble campaign because he had won and there were three of us really in the office and mm -hmm. kind of steered things and sent out press releases and whatnot. So you did... So you, you were at the law firm for a time, then you went and worked mm -hmm. for Saxby, and, but you were in Macon. Yeah, I was in Macon. Now, I, I was volunteered. For, I never actually got paid working for Saxby. I did it okay. all through college and law school. Um, and because I could fix the computers in the campaign office, Saxby had a friend, George Hall, who needed his computer fixed and started fixing his computer. And then he, had a, he and Saxby had a good friend who had a law firm, and they needed someone to fix their computers. And, mm -hmm. hey, you're in law school. Why don't you come clerk for us, and you can be tech support. And Were you writing at the time, too, other than doing uh, legal writing? I wasn't doing a ton of legal writing at the time. I, I was writing press releases for right. Saxby's campaign and um, got into legal writing in law school. They started a legal writing program at Mercer while I was there and fell into it and really wound up liking the the writing transactional aspect of law much more than the courtroom aspect. Gotcha. So how you met your wife in law school? How'd y'all meet? So our roommates, our freshman year of college at Mercer were engaged to each other. Okay. Uh, my roommate decided he was gay, broke up with his fiance. Mm -hmm. uh, Christy decided she did not want to be an engineer. So her dad made her go back to West Georgia and finish up there. Never saw her again until my senior year in law school. Seven years later, she emailed me out of the blue and we started dating and got <laughs> married a year later. Wow. So when did you start writing in earnest outside of doing press releases and, and writing in a, in a volunteer campaign capacity? Um, really, 2002, 2003. Yeah. I was a lawyer at the time out of law school and just started uh, was actually leaving comments. This was right when blogs were really starting. Mm -hmm. Was leaving comments on a bunch of other sites and emailing the writers. And I uh, actually emailed Jonah Goldberg at National Review several times. And he finally wrote back and said, look, there's this thing called a blog. You just should go get one and start it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started one. I called it Confessions of a Political Junkie. That's and right. started that. And then the four friends of mine started Red State. And they, or three friends of them, then they needed someone to write about Georgia politics. So this was 94. And they asked if I would start writing about Georgia politics. And shortly thereafter, I was running political campaigns as well. They knew that I was an elections lawyer. They needed one of those because they were set up as a 527 group at the time. And they put me in charge of it. <clears throat> and MSNBC called and asked in October of 2004 if I would come blog the election for them. I was one of three bloggers they brought up. They didn't pay us. They ran through my law firm, though, as a client. Uh, flew me up to New York, kept me there for a week, covering the Kerry Bush race at the end. And as I was headed up there, one of the partners at my law firm came in and said, do you know what the definition of a dumbass is? I said, I had no idea. He said, you. You, <laughs> you don't like practicing law. You like politics. Go figure out a way to make it work, which he actually wound up, um, the last campaign I ever ran was his for Superior Court. Uh, he got appointed by Governor Deal last year to be on the Court of Appeals, and now he's the district court judge in Macon, Trip Self. Okay. Uh, I, I, had he not come into my office and, and given me that talk, I probably would still be a miserable lawyer. But right. set the wheels in motion, and a year later I left to start running Red State full-time. And So you started, you were at Red State, and then you, you, worked, you became editor later. Correct? Yeah, I my my re, my specific first day on the job as editor of Red State was like June first of two thousand five. Mm -hmm. Was unpaid for a year. Um, June July first of two thousand six. 
became paid and we wound up getting an offer to buy the site in January 1st, 2007. It got bought by Eagle Publishing up in Washington and I had a contract, three year guarantee to stay and just kind of stayed. And in 2009, CNN called and asked if I wanted to be a political contributor for them. And then at the end of 2010, Herman Cain decided to run for president. Mm -hmm. WSB needed someone to take his job. And I, I had <clears throat> been a, a volunteer radio host in Macon his local host got arrested in a drug raid, and the <laughs> he was the the morning host at the local station in Macon was he claimed to be making a rap label. There was lots of drugs in the house when the police stormed it. They asked me to fill in for a day. The day turned into a week. The week turned into three months unpaid. What and, station was this? In uh, WMAC in Macon, nine mm -hmm. forty a.m. Mm -hmm. And during that three month period. Herman decided he was running for president. Uh, WSB fired the guy who they had intended to be Neil Bortz's replacement. We're looking for somebody and called and asked if... Was that, was that Michael Savage? No, it's Chris Kroc. Chris Kroc. Okay, that's right. And the station in Macon wound up hiring Chris Kroc. Okay. And the station in Atlanta wound up hiring me thinking I had a radio show. They didn't realize I had just been a kind of volunteer fill-in. Uh, the local station in Macon paid me in an expired gift certificate to Outback Steakhouse. Yeah, and I know that Outback Steakhouse. Yeah, now I got a radio show. Mm -hmm. did, did Backing up a bit to the, your time, you know, to Red State, what, um, I mean, you, we, you had opinion journalism or opinion media for, you know, decades before right. this. What um, did, what peer groups were, did you, what, what groups, I mean, the conservative blogging was a new thing when you right. were coming along. What what peers did you feel where you were parallel with on the conservative world, and and did y'all really understand what y'all were creating as you were creating it? No, we didn't. Um, and it was kind of interesting. So the three friends of mine who really started it: Josh Trevino, Ben Dominich, and Mike Krumpaski. It was their idea. I get credit for it a lot, but it was them. Right. Uh, Josh is the one. He ran a website, wrote it under a pseudonym called Tacitus. Uh, it was a highly popular blog at the time, left and right. Uh, and he had this idea, Marcos Melitzis had started Daily Coast, and he wanted something on the right. Uh, got Ben Dominich and Mike Krampaski involved. They all had government jobs at the time. It was a 527, so they couldn't be paid by it. They needed someone to come in and kind of help manage it. And they were all three of them. Ben's gone on to do The Federalist. Um, Josh works for Texas Public Policy Foundation. Mike mm -hmm. is in PR. And they all had an idea of you would have 50 writers, each one covering the politics of a state, and they would be more long form pieces. I was much more focused on conservative activism. It was what I had done. And I was writing short pieces on Georgia politics and then they felt comfortable enough to let me write about national politics. And it was much more to conservative activists at a time where with the Bush administration, there was a growing perception that they weren't quite as conservative as people thought. And we knew we had hit on something when the immigration fight started with the Bush administration and they started responding to me and what I was writing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when Sandra Day O'Connor and William Rehnquist left the Supreme Court, I just happened to luck out and have a good friend who was involved in the vetting process, worked in the White House, and was feeding me information. And we went beyond just the activism stuff, and I started breaking stories. I was the first person to point out that uh, Harriet Myers had donated Al Gore in 88. And then when he named uh, William um, or Chief Justice John Roberts, I was I beat ABC News to breaking the story that Roberts was going to be the the nominee, and, and then Alito after him. It just totally lucked out through coincidence that I had people feeding me this information. That just exploded the site from there, mm -hmm. and it really became focused on not responding necessarily to Democrats, but much more the intra-Republican fight of conservative activists versus the establishment. Was there something in particular where you? You you um, felt like you made that transition from. I mean, you, the Red State started as a response to Daily Coast, mm -hmm. um, and so you are. There's a repartee back and forth with the Democrat with you right. know, with liberals and Democrats. When did you start? Was there a, a pivotal moment that it started? Y'all started looking at as conservatives looking at the Republican Party and saying that this you know criticizing them from the right. It really was the Harriet Myers and the immigration fights gotcha. that started it. Uh, and then the site very much became a place for conservative activists. Uh, we would certainly focus on the Democrats, but also on Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, and in 2009, I guess it was, we decided we had had this thing going since 2004 and built this huge community of online activists. 
And I literally just put up a piece at the site that just said, who wants to come to Atlanta and grab a beer? And had like 400 people say, this would be an awesome idea. So we started this red state gathering. We wound up having 200 some odd people show up and decided it would be about getting conservatives elected in primaries. And our first red state gathering, we had um, a guy down in Florida who was in the state legislature named Marco Rubio, had the Texas Solicitor General Ted Cruz was there, um, had a former congressman named Pat Toomey who was there, and had a state legislator in South Carolina named Nikki Haley who wow. showed up. And they all, all of those names, elected. all of those names are in my notes because of your your very public relations and friendship with those. Yeah, people. It, it all started mm -hmm. then and there. We I didn't know Nikki Haley from Adam, and she showed up at the Red State Gathering. We struck up a friendship. I'll never forget. She called me at the end of that year. Uh, we had done some fundraising for her, and called me like three weeks before Christmas. She said, "I am out of money. Have nothing in the bank account." and we are going to lose this race. Can you do something? I said, well, I'll start writing. And I committed to write every single day. And we raised ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 like within 48 hours. And her campaign manager, who got to be a friend of mine, Tim, he called me and he says, you gotta stop. He said, she won't leave the office. She's just watching these low dollar donations come in. And kind of knew that there was something there. By March, when Sarah Palin endorsed her, she invited me to come over and introduce Palin in front of the state capitol and mm -hmm. went on to become governor. Right. The um these these gatherings became real pivotal, you know, to to red state. I mean, it's mm -hmm. sort of a it's it's they I mean you had them annually, correct? Yep. Um and uh but the at the same time there's other, you know, I mean, there's other conservative opinion groups. I mean, Breitbart was right. was, was was I mean, like what what was um I mean, what what lane, what differentiated your lane from the Glenn Becks, the Andrew Breitbarts? I mean, like, because there is a, there is a level of, of, of um, you know, none of y'all in that talking head world really shot away from controversy or, right. or criticizing your own party from the right. And, uh, but when, what made this different? Because the gatherings look different. Something yeah. feels different about, uh, feels different about red state. Um, I always hate to use the word authenticity. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think there's something to that. Um, I, I'm i not a Washington creature of Washington. Mm -hmm. I live in Macon, Georgia. I don't have the ambition to be in Washington or New York. Um, don't have the ambition to, to want to be up there and, and play those games. I don't view myself as intending to shape the conversation. Um, you don't? I, I, no, I don't. Wow. I, I view my role as telling people what I think, and knowing that there are a lot of people who are not blessed to be have that platform to share mm -hmm. those views. And all I do is say that. And if it resonates, it resonates. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, and it, it was never really to shape anything. Over time, it became clear to me that I could help people uh, who were good. My wife, in 2006, uh, the week before Christmas of 2006, was given six months to live. Mm -hmm. And it was a misdiagnosis. Uh, literally the same day that she was given this diagnosis. Uh, my partners at Red State called and said, we're really out of money. The Democrats had taken back the house and no one wanted to advertise on a right-wing site anymore with the Democrats in charge. And it just it, my world fell literally was just, I shouldn't keep using the word literally, but it, it was crumbling. Mm -hmm. um, my wife is dying, we have a one-year-old. Uh, I'm out of a job. Uh, I'm on her insurance. She's not going to be around, so I'm not going to have that. I'm going to have a be a single dad. And we sat in the hospital room that night. She was convinced nothing was wrong. The doctors were convinced that she's dead. What was the diagnosis? Um, of she they found a blood clot in her jugular vein, okay. which led them to finding spots in her lungs, which mm -hmm. led them to conclude she had a very rare form of cancer that had spread to her lungs and. Mm -hmm that had it, this type of cancer, once it gets to your lungs, there's nothing they can do. And um, it's only a matter of time before you die. Chemo won't work. There's mm -hmm. no treatment for it. Um, so we sat in her hospital room that night talking about what I should do. And she said that she had viewed me based on what I'd done at Red State when I was a lawyer as, as a catapult. And that I, if I was going to do anything, my job should be to try to catapult good people and good ideas into the arena so people could vet them. And that has kind of, that conversation kind of stuck with me as to that's how I would do this with Red State or wherever I went is try to 
expose people on my side to the ideas and people that I thought were worth doing. Now, thankfully, she was misdiagnosed then. Uh, she does have lung cancer now, but it was a misdiagnosis in 2006. She's still around. Mm -hmm. But that was kind of the defining conversation that really gave me focus. Before that, it was just me and, and friends. And we were just doing what we were doing, and I was running this website. We had no focus. I knew demographically, I was in my early 30s at the time, but I knew demographically that our readership was, the average age was 42, 70% were men, uh, something like 80% of them had kids, um, more than 60% commuted more than 30 minutes to a job, and they were almost all white collar workers, and they much more preferred uh, sports than politics. And if there was any differentiation between Red State and everyone else, we were not 100% politics focused. We were much more living our life. This is something we've done with kids. Here's a great recipe. Let's talk football. Right. Uh, and people gravitated towards that. The, the more interesting fact, though, is that 90% of our readers did not consider themselves blog readers. Mm -hmm. So we had this market of conservative activists who they weren't reading the, the big sites at the time, Michelle Malkin and Hot Air and, and blogs like that. They weren't reading those sites. They were reading Red State to get their news and information and then going about their business. And that's why I think we were able to pull off the gathering because people, politicians knew they could come to the red state gathering and they were going to encounter people who were involved in politics, but also in their communities. Mm -hmm. And it, it made all the difference. Did, um, let's switch gears for a second, talk about Peach Pundit. Mm -hmm. You started Peach Pundit. 2006. 2006. It very quickly became what, um, if you when you if you worked at the Capitol during the legislative session, whether you were lobbying in the hall or sitting in one of those chairs as an elected official, you read that before you ever yeah. got to work, before you got your shoes on in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, what? Um, tell me about the group that started it with you, and um, and how that did it start like that? You know, at, yeah. And it, did it, did so it the main reason it started was uh, my friend Clayton Wager had. Red State had gotten so big so fast that we were dying constantly and literally had this random person, God, I said it again, uh, had this random person <laughs> email us. We didn't know who he was. And he's like, look, I'm a, I'm a reader. I'm in tech. I live in Alpharetta. And if you'll give me your passwords and your logins for your websites and, and IP, I can get your site online. We, he could have been a left-wing activist for all we knew, but right. we're like, here are the passwords, here's the IP address, here's our server. Here's my social and security he, number. Yeah, basically, <laughs> and he got it all working, and uh, he and I developed a real good friendship, and by 2006, he called, he was on the board at, for Red State, and he said, you know what, you and I should just do a horse race site. It's who's up, who's down, what's happening in Georgia politics. Forget all the national stuff, forget the high-minded public policy stuff, just a what's happening in Georgia horse race style between Ralph Reed and Casey Cagle. Mm -hmm. And the rule we started with was that we were going in and we were going to find Democrats who were willing to write critically about the Democratic Party. And their rule was that they're not allowed to write about the Democrats and, or they're not allowed to write about the Republicans. And I am not allowed to write about the Democrats. And I will be as candid and frank and, 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 exposing the Republican Party as you are about the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And that worked really well until around 2010, where my profile between being on CNN and Red State had gotten so big that no one took seriously anymore my ability to write critically of my own party, despite my record. Sure. Um, anything I wrote was viewed through a partisan lens. And Clayton and I were like, you know, we've got uh, Charlie Harper was writing his Icarus Pundit, and they were mm -hmm. like, I should probably, I don't have the bandwidth for it anymore, and we should pass it off to other people. And so we passed it off to Charlie, who ran it until uh, wanted to go do his own thing. Um, but for the longest time... And the iteration is still, you still, oh, it's called something different, but it's yeah, what you look it, at when you... Right. When, I mean, if you work in Georgia politics, it's what you look at. Yeah, it is. And the whole point of it was, and I don't know that they still do it as, as much like this, but it was absolutely... Democrats should write there and Republicans should write there and none of the Republicans should write about the Democrats and none of the Democrats should write about the Republicans, but each owes it to the other side to write as candidly about their own party as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can understand the machinations of what goes on. Uh, what do you think they're doing good? What do you think they're doing bad? And I, I love that style. And, and now even with the resurgence and all my radio show, I try to do that, that 
this is what I think my side is doing right, this is what I think they're doing wrong. And we've gotten so tribal now, it's much harder to do that because you get blown up by your own side for right. daring to cast stones at it. But I'm, that's kind of now what I do. Mm -hmm. So the um, you just you, you jumped into a little... Oh, tell me about Resurgent. Why, what... what why did it? Um, Why did you start it? What you know? What did it come from? Um, a, a couple of reasons. One was uh, Red State eventually got bought by Salem Communications, and Salem is a competitor to my radio station. They had made a number of promises about integrating my radio show into Red State, and never fulfilled them. And it just became more and more obvious if I wanted to do this the way I want to do it and try to integrate the web and radio together, I need to go do my own thing. Mm -hmm. um, the other reason was it just wasn't fun anymore. Red State had gotten big. Uh, it had a lot of writers and I'm not good at ego management. I just, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm a terrible manager. I want to write uh, and I don't care that this person and this person on the site hate each other's guts and don't want to write on the same day as each other. That's, it, it, I mean, that's not my thing. I, I don't want to manage sure. egos. And it was just time for me to go do my own thing. Um, and it was kind of, I hate to say it made me feel good, but it kind of did. They had already in 2005, June of 2015, it was uh, my 40th birthday. I had been running Red State for 10 years and I sent them an email and said, you know, this is my last year. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the big shindig in Atlanta, uh, had all the Republican presidential candidates save one come. Mm -hmm. And they had already planned the next year's in Denver for 2016. So uh, I promised them I'd show up at that one, uh, finished the end of 2015, stopped getting paid, started the resurgent, showed up in Denver for the 2016 or Red State Gathering, and they had trouble getting sponsors. None of the speakers wanted to come because I wasn't there. And it, it, it really did kind of make me feel good that none of these people wanted to come because I wasn't there. Right. Um, so after two years of the resurgent, and it's not a big site, but I, I think it carries the influence now that Red State used to have. Um, and it's, it was nice to be able to put on this resurgent gathering this past year and have the Secretary of Energy and congressmen and others show up and keep these mm -hmm. conversations. The one thing I wanted to do differently with this event was at Red State, it was all campaign speeches. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I don't know what it means to be a Republican really anymore or what it even means to be a conservative. And so I insisted that everyone sit on stage and we have a conversation about policy and ideas and not a campaign speech. And I, I loved the format. It was exhausting because I was on stage the entire day interviewing mm -hmm. people, but it was fun to have these conversations and mm -hmm. to, to do this. Um, and still now... Now having the runway to try to continue to integrate my radio show and website together. What um, what do you mean by the you don't know what it means to be a Republican or a conservative these days? Well, so I was on city council in Macon, and I told people all the time that there was never a Republican or a Democratic position on trash collection. Mm -hmm. There was certainly an ideological position: do you keep it government run or do you privatize it? And I was on the privatized side. Um, and I, I knew those ideological issues, but the Republican Party has a platform for it nationally. And it's a free trade platform. It's a pro-life platform. It is a, a platform of using our global influence. And yet the Republicans today are big on tariffs and winding down their operations in the world. And so what does it mean to be a Republican other than you apologize for the dumb things the president says mm -hmm. and you're not a Democrat? Uh, what is your governing philosophy? And, and I don't know that there is one. And I, I don't believe that I've changed as a conservative. The views I had before Donald Trump ran for office are the exact same views I've got now. Um, but for a lot of conservatives now, it seems like I'm whatever Donald Trump says is going to be it, which is very much like what almost all of these exact same people did with George Bush. Mm -hmm. That whatever George Bush said conservatism was is what conservatism was. Matt Latimer, who worked for Bush, uh, wrote in his book that Bush one day said that he was conservative. Whatever he wanted to be conservative was conservative because he was a conservative. Mm -hmm. It's not the way it works. Right. The um, I want to stick to this for a second. Stick with this for a second. Um, Molly Ball wrote about you once. Erickson's conservatism is more of a traditional bent, deeply informed by his evangelical faith. He believes Republicans must not yield in pursuit of small government, strong national defense, and the primacy of traditional family. That is that conservatism. I, for me, it is. Right. 
and I, I think whether it was Hayek or Russell Kirk, you would you would find similar veins in that. Even Goldwater, before he got old, was a similar vein. Smaller government, um, supportive family, mm -hmm. and strong national defense. It, it's what Republicans in 2012 campaigned on, the three-legged stool of the Republican Party. Um, but now suddenly they're perfectly happy having the strong man in Washington do everything. You know, I tell people all the time, I am a conservative because I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. I think we're all sinners, and so I want as few of them in charge of me as possible. Right. And you get as few sinners in charge of you as possible by having the smallest government possible. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in traditional families, in addition to we as a species should be reproducing ourselves, mm -hmm. that a two-parent nuclear household is the most stable way to do that and not have long-term downsides to society. So all of these things are what conservatives have stood for for, I mean, hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly it's whatever the president says it is. You've been, um, of those three prongs, faith is one of them. And, and you said earlier that, you know, that lane of evangel you know, evangelical Republicans was your lane when you were young. Mm -hmm. um, you've been fine-tuning it recently. And what, tell me about your, your decision to go to seminary, um, the, um, that whole, you know, how, how you're, um, you educating your faith um, educates your politics. It, it dawned on me, I don't know, maybe I've been doing it for four years, so probably five, six years ago. It, it really hit me that I couldn't find a difference between what I believed theologically and what I believed politically. And mm -hmm. I knew that couldn't be true because the Republican Party is not the party of Jesus. So there had to be somewhere in there that I was going wrong. And it finally dawned on me that, you know, maybe I should conform my politics more to my faith instead of my faith to my politics. And then having had a radio show, I started talking about faith issues on the radio a lot and more and more. And I started getting small churches who their preacher was gone. They needed someone to fill in for them. Mm -hmm. And they would call and say, hey, will you be our guest pastor this Sunday. And I felt really awkward doing that because I was a conservative talk show host who had never been to seminary. Mm -hmm. So I finally decided, you know what, maybe this is God's way of telling me you should go to seminary. So it did. Did um, you ever preach at one of those churches? No. So I, I went to Reformed Theological, Fellow, or Theological Seminary here in Atlanta, mm -hmm. mentioned that I was going to seminary. I now felt comfortable having done it for more than a year, having taken a lot of the systematic classes. I, I now felt comfortable getting in the pulpit and preaching. And some of these small churches reached out and said, this is great, where are you going to school? The Reformed Theological Seminary. Said, oh, you're Reformed. Well, thank you. Click. <laughs> <laughs> so, nope, I've never preached in a single one of those. Had I gone to a good dispensationalist school, I probably would, but <laughs> not, not from one of those, those you know, creepy Calvinists. Um, <laughs> so I, I have now preached several times, and I, I like it way more than talking politics. Great. And, um, it's, it's been fun, but it's also been kind of eye-opening that I think the Republican Party, so much of evangelicalism in politics, much like conservatism in politics, has been consumed by cults of personality in politics. And so what the politician says is good for your faith or good conserv conservatism becomes so, mm -hmm. even though you can look at the history of conservatism or scripture and say, no, this doesn't align with the values that I claim to have. And it turns out a lot of conservatives really don't have those values, and a lot of them are pay to play. Mm -hmm. Well, the um, do you? I mean, do you still? Are you still preaching? How often? I, I am very rarely. Uh, I got to preach in Dallas in October at the Ethics and Religious Liberty uh, Commission's mm -hmm. family conference. Uh, more speaking slash preaching. Gotcha. Uh, I preached in Colorado a while back. I don't actually think I've preached in a single church in Georgia. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, I have, nowhere in Georgia have I preached. I always go out of state. The um, uh, before we move into the the Georgia politics stuff, um, I want to ask you about you. You you know mentioned him a number of times just about the president, about you disinviting him mm -hmm. to red state, um, and just sort of this. You know, you have a contentious relationship with the idea of President Trump. <laughs> to be yeah. to put it lightly, so. I met him in 2011 when he was first getting started in politics. He wrote a book, Regnery Publishing was a sister company to Red State. They asked me to go up and interview him. And I spent an hour or so with him, maybe 30 minutes on camera and 
30 minutes just chatting. And it was kind of funny because he's like, oh, you play golf. And I was like, well, I'm terrible. He's like, well, I can beat you on my golf course. And you should come down to Mar-a-Lago. You should come hang out. Bring your family down to Mar-a-Lago. And then I was like, this is kind of weird. He doesn't really know me. Mm-hmm. And then his assistant called the house and started getting emails. And my wife, who's a way smarter person than me, said, this man wants to own your soul. You, you're not allowed to go there. And so I never did um, turn him down. They stopped talking. Uh, and occasionally had interactions with people around him. And then in 2016, uh, I wrote a piece, of, and I think I entitled it, Why Donald Trump Matters. And it was uh, this guy, he may be a billionaire, but he connects with this blue-collar contempt for Washington. He mm-hmm. voices a lot of things I hear people I know say. It sounds like He's, Zito's, the way that Zito looked at Yeah, very much mm-hmm. so. Um, and that I, we can't dismiss this guy. And I got a very nice handwritten note from him. He had actually printed out my piece and writ, wrote in Sharpie on it. <laughs> um, but then we got to the Red State Gathering. I was, not, I was not going to invite him, and this is the thing that doesn't get mentioned. Enough. He wasn't on the list. Sam Nunberg from his campaign called and begged me to find a slot. So we worked it in for him to speak. We had already filled up the entire agenda. We, so we worked it for him to speak at the um, Football Hall of Fame for our closeout rally. And uh, I knew that there had to be something there because we had this massive spike in registrations when it was announced. They were like, all right, this is, this is going to be something. Well, then they had the debate the night before with Megyn Kelly. I worked at Fox. He essentially says she's asking him these questions because she's on her period. And mm-hmm. then I was actually out at my fam- with my family for dinner when he made that comment to Don Lemon. And I got back and all these mostly female reporters actually come up to me and say, what are you going to do about Trump? What are you going to do about him here? So I said, well, what did he do? And so I saw the clip myself. I was like, wow, I can't believe he did this. And I emailed Corey Lewandowski and said, there are a lot of people here, including some that I work with and a lot of female reporters who think that this is what he meant, that she was having her period. This was a hormonal issue. And could you guys clarify this? And... So he calls me and says, what do you mean? I said, well, Corey calls, yeah, Corey calls okay. me. Corey calls me and he says, I, listen, I, I don't know if this is what he meant, but I've seen the video now and the clear implication, the way I'm hearing it, is that he intended to say Megyn Kelly went down this line of questioning because she was on a period. And he says, well, I don't think that's what he meant. I says, well, I'm telling you, that's what it seems to me. And there are a lot of people here who are really upset about it. And I don't want him and this to be a distraction I've got eight other presidential candidates coming. I do not want this to be a distraction to them if he can clarify this. So he's like, all right, I'll see what I can do. Called me, that was about midnight. Calls me back about 1230 in the morning. And he says, I've talked to Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump says that he would never think that. He would never say that. And he resents the implication. I said, so is he going to release a statement? Clarify that. Nope. I said, well, listen, I don't think I can have him here if he's not going to clarify this, because if he's here, all of these other candidates are going to get asked about this. They're not going to be able to make their case. He's going to overshadow them. And he's like, well, that's regrettable, but I understand. And that was the end of the conversation. Next morning, they sent out a press release with chronicling every terrible thing I had ever said in life. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can you believe that this guy would uninvite me? And I really did it because I thought it would be unfair to the other candidates. And of course, it wound up being, it was overshadowed. My uninviting him overshadowed everything. Right. Um, but that was why I really did it. There were so many people who were offended. He didn't want to clarify, and I didn't want it to be an issue for any of the other candidates that they mm-hmm. were going to have to address if he was coming. They wound up having to do it anyway, so maybe I should have left him come, but I, I, it seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Uh, and it became this huge issue, and, and it was kind of funny. I guess I'm far enough removed now. That I've never talked about this before. Um, Bill Shine called me Saturday morning of the... Red State Gathering, it's become mm-hmm. huge news. And he said, I want you to know I talked to Roger. And Roger, or Roger Ailes, wants you to know he thinks you have balls of steel for what you did, and you've got a job here for life. Thank you for sticking up for Megan. And I was like, well, okay. Um, by Monday, it was over, and Neil Cavuto had me on his show at Fox. This was Monday, August 2015 and asked me why I invited him, told him exactly what I just told you. And he says, well, let me read you all the things you've said. And I said, Neil, this isn't about me. 
And he says, well, what makes you think that you're better than him, that you should be able to uninvite him? And I said, well, I've apologized for the things I've said that I did wrong. He, I asked him to clarify or apologize, and he refused. And if he's not going to apologize for saying something like that, when that's clear implication, I'm not going to invite him to my event. And at which point, Cavuto said something like, he didn't think I had the moral authority to do something like that. It's like, it's my event. Mm -hmm. Did not go back on Neil Cavuto's show until January of 2018. Uh, was not invited back on until then. Uh, that night, uh, Sean Hannity, who actually comes on on my radio station right before me, uh, invited me to come on and explain myself. He had Michael Cohen come on, um, explain what an awful, terrible person I was, an enemy of humanity and the like. And then as I was about to go on to respond, they canceled my interview and kept Cohen on for another 30 minutes and then didn't get invited on any shows that week. Mm -hmm. So I called Bill Shine and said, you know, I feel like I'm being thrown under the bus for defending Megyn Kelly. And, no, 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 no. And he was able to get me on Fox and Friends for something. And then I started getting a little bit more. Um, but there's this lingering feeling that no one ever said it, but it seemed very clear that I was the proxy that Cavuto and Hannity and some of these other guys and, and Greta Van Susteren, they couldn't attack Megan. So they would attack me instead of Megan uh, mm -hmm. to make it about Megan. And she was uh, very gracious and very kind. Um, and Rupert Murdoch's kids were as well. Uh, but it just became very clear after that that my long term tenure at Fox was no more. Uh, it was kind of funny in 2016, February 2016, my contract with Fox was up. Roger had done the whole you got a job for life thing. And the Fox lawyer called and says, Roger wants you to know that he stands by as you have a job for life at Fox. We need you to take an 85% pay cut. <laughs> I was like, no. And so I emailed Roger. I was like, look, here's everything I've done for you guys. He's like, okay, can, can you take a 10% cut? And I said, yeah. And I, I needed the job at the time very much. And so I stayed another two years and hardly ever got on. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was abundantly clear by December of 2017, I did not want to stay. I didn't think they wanted me. And sure enough, in January, they called after I had already, I don't feel like I was fired because I already told them I didn't want to come back. And in January, they called and said, yeah, we don't think we want you to stay around either. So that was the end of Fox. What happens, I mean, was there a, a moment where, I mean, you, the, you, you basically created the space of conservative blocking. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you definitely perfected, but you know, like made it, created a, you professionalized it. Mm -hmm. The, um, what happened when that, I hate the word space, but when that space on the internet is, was there a moment where the, the, the Bannons of the world and the, and the Breitbart, the Breitbart era of the world, I mean, it seems like we woke up and it was the shock value of the Bannons of Breitbart right. were, were. Well, it, had replaced what Red State was, which was still, yeah. you know, firebrand. There was some controversy mm -hmm. around Red State and, and, and so forth, but it was different. It, yeah, it was. And, and Andrew, when he was there, had this had a very strong sense of he wanted to do reporting and he wanted to do the, the ambush journalism. And I mm -hmm. never, I, I didn't have the budget to do it. I didn't have any investment and I didn't have any interest in doing that sort of reporting. And they mm -hmm. certainly... I never viewed it as competitors. They certainly took a different track. Uh, we were much more political politician focused and they were much more owning the left, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when Andrew died and, and Bannon amped it up, it became this nationalist populist thing. Uh, and did y'all, did y'all talk as y'all were rising together? I mean, were y'all, Andrew, did y'all work together? I would get phone calls from Andrew Breitbart at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, and I, I'll never forget one time I got a, <laughs> I got a phone call from him and it was, I want to say it was probably nine o'clock my time. And he's talking to me about, this was during the, the acorn scandal. And he's hi, I, I need your help. I need you. And he's trying to break down. He's like, Oh shit, I'm getting pulled over. I'm using my cell phone. I'll call you back. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. So never heard from him. And then at three o'clock in the morning, my phone rang and it's Andrew Breitbart. I've got do not disturb on my phone. So he had to call twice to, to, to get me, woke me up. I was like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, it's three o'clock in the morning. They're sorry and hung up. And like three weeks later, he called it. This was typically, this would happen all the time. I would get calls after midnight and wake me up. And then he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize what time it was there. Call me later and hang up. 
<laughs> which apparently is is was kind of kind of what he did. Mm -hmm. I I had one encounter with Steve Bannon. I never actually met him. He wanted to come premiere his Sarah Palin movie at a Red State event. Mm -hmm. And then he got upset that we wouldn't pay for his plane ticket. And then he got upset we wouldn't provide a limo. And then he got upset we wouldn't provide a hotel room. And my position was we didn't even know about this thing. You wanted to come do it. You cover the costs. And so he wound up, I think I didn't go to it. And then I, he got offended because I didn't go to the thing. Um, but that was my only interaction. I never actually laid eyes on him. Um, he apparently hates my guts, but has for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I, I, my problem, if I could be critical of myself, was I never had an interest to really do any of this stuff. I didn't view myself as building a movement. I was just writing what I thought about stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you liked it, you liked it. If you didn't, go read something else. Um, the, some of these other sites, Breitbart in particular, had real business plans to grow and corner a market and hire reporters. And I just... I never had any interest in doing that. By then, I was doing radio and knew that was my future. Do you think that the red state model gave way to Breitbart in some form of fashion? I mean, do you think this was? I mean, there's, this is a, it's an argument that I a criticism of of conservative media that 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 happens often. Yeah. That that you know you don't get Donald Trump without what Eric Erickson was doing. I'm sure yeah. you've heard this. I'm not the first oh, yeah. one to say this. Doing in in the early 2000s. I mean, right. is there is there a um, was there a trajectory from Red State to Breitbart to... Um, yeah, possibly you know. so. Um, although I, I think a lot of it, you know, Andrew Breitbart had helped the Drudge Report and then did Huffington Post, got it started, and wanted to do something like that on the right. Mm -hmm. And I think that had more to do with getting Breitbart started than anything I ever did. Um, I do think, yeah, and I have written that, yeah, you know, the, the, the rise of the conservative activists taking back their party... Um, that I think I really was one of the chief people responsible for in, in the 2005-2006 era uh, did have something to do with Donald Trump. And when people push me on that, I always tell them, had the Republican establishment not made and broken so many promises, you wouldn't have had me. So if you, if you want to blame me for Donald Trump, I only existed because you guys kept making promises to the base that you then got elected and broke. So you're stopping too soon in the blame game. Um, definitely the fact that, that Trump wanted to woo me and, and be involved in some way with Red State's audience, uh, definitely think that there was this level of conservative activism they were feeding off of and, and the evangelical movement and others. Um, but all of that existed because of the, the sclerotic Republican Party by the time George Bush left office. Um, mm -hmm. I also think there's something to the theory I, I have long maintained that, and I think we're seeing this with the Democratic Party now, um, that there is something to be said for an incumbent party having a vice president who runs after an eight-year term. Because then you, you as a party can have a referendum on that president's legacy through his proxy. Um, the Republican Party didn't have that in 2008, and as a result had to go back to 2000 and refight all the same fights over again. Uh, and now the Democratic Party is having to start refighting all those Barack Obama fights. Uh, had Cheney run in 2008, we could have gotten it out of our system then. Had Biden run uh, this past time, the Democrats could have gotten it out of their system. And it, it, when it, you don't, it festers. Republicans, I think, finally exercised it to some degree when Jeb Bush ran in 2016, making mm -hmm. him the proxy for George. But by then, it had festered for so long. Mm -hmm. Let's let's come back to Georgia. Okay. The um, uh, Georgia Democrats held on to power in some, you know, whether it's a you know, Democrat name only quite literally. I mean, a, a completely different party, but, right. you know, early on. Um, but they held on to power for, you know, a long time. I mean, how? How did they, how were they able to hold on to power specifically in Georgia um, while other southern states were flipping right. into Republican hands, in your opinion? Well, by and large, I mean, even now, a lot of your Republicans were Democrats and just changed the letter after their name. I mean, mm -hmm. Nathan Deal, we have yet to have a Republican governor in Georgia who wasn't a Democrat previously. Um, we, with, if Kemp gets elected, it'll be the first time. Um, Democrats in Georgia were able to do it through a number of ways. One was uh, they always seemed very Republican as the state shifted. Uh, two was your off-year elections 
were viewed differently from your presidential election. So you could programmatically in presidential elections go vote Republican and in your off-year elections go vote for your local friend who just still has a D next to his name, but we all know he's a Republican. Uh, and then at the local level, you, you've still got parts of the state where Democrats have to run as Republicans now up in Cherokee County, but in most of the state, Republicans still run as Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't trickled down that far. Uh, but Democrats, I think, when you get to 2002 and they do that wild redistricting that, I mean, I point out to Democrats all the time who were upset about Republican gerrymandering, you should have seen what Democrats were doing in mm -hmm. 2002. I ran Cecil Staten's congressional race in 2002. It's running in the 11th congressional district. We made it to a runoff against Phil Gangry and lost. But there was a point in that district where you could literally pole vault from one side of the district to the other over another congressional district. Mm -hmm. It was drawn that narrowly uh, to keep it as a it, it, Democratic district, and the Republicans wound up winning. At some point, the Democrats overplayed their hand. Uh, Roy Bar And I really do think a lot of it had to do with the redistricting, mm -hmm. that it exposed the Democrats as being vulnerable because it was so blatant, doing multi-member districts, things like that. And it turned off a lot of local politicians who felt like they were being marginalized, mm -hmm. which caused a, a low-level switch in the party. And then to cobble their coalition together and keep it from folding, the state-level leaders, Roy Barnes and others, I think got heavy-handed enough that you saw people like Sonny Perdue realize they had an opportunity to take charge. And essentially, I think Sonny Perdue's, they would take issue with me, but I, ultimately I think that what Sonny Perdue did was lead a coup of the Democratic Party, but just rebranded it as the Republican Party. Right. Do you, I mean, how much, I mean, you just sort of answered this question, how much blame does the Republican Party deserve in, I mean, the state naturally flipping, but how much, I mean, how much, if, if, if Governor Barnes forced a lot of folks out by the heavy handedness of redistricting, right. how much credit does the Republican Party deserve of being there to catch them? Because that's... Uh, had Sonny Perdue not flipped, I don't know that the Republicans would have put up a candidate to beat Roy Barnes. Mm -hmm. uh, it had a lot more to do with opportunism within the Democratic Party than it did anything the Republican Party had. By Zell and then, then um, Roy had so thoroughly beaten the Republicans at the state level. Mm -hmm. You did have this sense, though, I think, after the 2000 redistricting, where there always seemed to be this level of comedy between the federal Republicans in Georgia and the state-level Democrats, that we know we're a majority Republican state, we will draw congressional districts to keep you guys happy. Mm -hmm. uh, once they drew those districts to shut uh, Saxby Chambliss out of his district, and he was like, to hell with you guys, I'm going to run for the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, that became kind of a, a breaking point, I think, between this... There was never an unwritten rule, but everyone kind of knew it. Uh, and suddenly the Republicans were going to put up a fight. Um, mm -hmm. it, had that redistricting, I, I really do believe this, the party would have ultimately taken power, but it would have been put off a little longer, but for the heavy handedness of that redistricting. Do, um, I mean, one of the things that you heard all the time back then was um, the Democratic Party would differentiate themselves by calling themselves Georgia Democrats. Yeah. Um, does that have does that term hold any water anymore? I mean, are they is there, you know, is there a difference between a Georgia Democrat and a National Democrat? I, I, I think the the I mean, my perception as a as a conservative is that they've lost that branding now. Mm -hmm. uh, that you used to have a coalition of rural black and white and suburban white Democrats with urban black and white Democrats, and now it's mostly a rural black and urban liberal party, mm -hmm. which is not the Democratic Party of 10 years ago. I mean, I know plenty of Democrats in the state who have told me, for example, that they want to want Brian Kemp to win because they think that'll purge the Democrats of this progressive itch that they've suddenly taken on, that they feel like has infected them from other states. Mm -hmm. Do um, the, is there, is, is the inverse true? I mean, is there, you know, there's a, there's the, uh, there's a lot of moderate Republicans. I mean, I think Georgia's mm -hmm. uh, has a tradition of electing moderate chamber, right. you know, centered Republicans. Paul Coverdale and Johnny Isaacson. Absolutely. And Governor Deal. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, they, is there a difference between a Georgia Republican and a national Republican at this yeah, point? Yeah, I think this is starting to break down as well. You've got a lot of Georgia Republicans rushing to, to be Trump mm -hmm. Republicans. 
And I think that hurts them as much as uh, the other. So now the question is, where are the numbers? Uh, I do think that Trump is temporary, not transitional, mm -hmm. uh, because most of the Republicans who work for him actually hate his guts, and they'll quickly move the party to where they want it to go when he's gone. I think that'll happen to some degree at the state level as well. Uh, I also think that you have enough Republicans in Georgia who are former Democrats who get the joke that they do have to be aggressively Trump in primaries and then moderate in the general election, mm -hmm. much more so than I think you now have a level of Democrats who think that they can be true believers the whole way through and never have to moderate. Right. Do you think, um, I mean, let's take these, this, I mean, this, the current, the two current nominees, but do you think that Brian Kemp is, has, is doing that? And do you think that Stacey Abrams is doing the, you can stay the course all the way through? And yeah, I, I definitely think so. I mean, all of a sudden Brian Kemp's, um, campaign commercials have gone from, I got a truck, I'm going to round up the illegals to I'm going to support small business and mm -hmm. I'm going to be a business governor. And yes, I want RIFRA, but I only want the federal RIFRA that Bill right. Clinton signed. I don't want any of this other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely think he's trying to make inroads, if for lack of a better term, the Buckhead Republicans who are perfectly happy to go Democrat as long as they don't get their taxes raised. Right. Um, Stacey Abrams, on the other hand, is still out there. Let's let sandblast Stone Mountain and take away people's guns and get mm -hmm. rid of the private school scholarship program and mm -hmm. things that make a lot of those Buckhead Republicans uh, identify with the Republican Party. Do you? I mean, the argument is that um, it'll uh, it'll excite more non-voters, and that match with Trump is a path. Do you buy How that? How does Georgia? Stacey Abrams in an off-year election excite more Democrats than Barack Obama did in a presidential election and still lose the state of Georgia? I, I don't see that happening. Gotcha. What about um, the, um, I mean, what's the math for Kemp then? What's the inverse? You know, I, I think he winds up getting 51, 52% of the vote as every Republican governor has this century so far. Uh, it will be slightly less it may be 50.9 to 51.2 because I do think there is an energized Democratic base uh, in Atlanta that will turn out in large part. Uh, but I don't think that the population has shifted enough in two years to, to differentiate itself. I mean, people forget 2016, the Democrats were fired up. Uh, they were fired up in 2012 for Barack Obama against Mitt Romney, and they turned out. Uh, but they didn't turn out enough. So I, I have a hard time believing there's been a massive population shift in the state of Georgia in a two-year period. Sure. I mean, that's it's and, and and you know, to the Democrats' credit, I mean, that's the this is the first time since Jimmy Carter was president that um, that Clinton won Gwinnett County, or that a Democrat, mm -hmm. the Democratic nominee right. for president, won Gwinnett and Cobb. Yeah. There's a 23 point swing for um, for uh, in the in the Price District mm -hmm. that that handle you know right. went on to beat John Ossoff, but yeah. but that swing is is substantial. It is, a, it is a substantial swing, and there are demographic changes the Republicans need to address in Gwinnett County in particular and mm -hmm. Cobb. Um, but that swing was also a lot of Republican women who couldn't stand Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's not on the ballot this time, and this isn't a federal race for someone to hold him accountable. Um, Do you think that Republicans can split off from Donald I mean. That's the question of, I guess, is what, yeah. the, you know, do you... I mean, I, I think that, that Stacey Abrams will work very hard to tie Brian Kemp to Donald Trump's endorsement. Mm -hmm. Say he wouldn't be there but for Donald Trump. He's Donald Trump's guy. Mm -hmm. And that will be effective to a degree. I just don't think it'll be enough um, because, again, Georgia has a history of voting Republican at the federal level and Democrat at the state level. And almost to, to a degree, we, we continue to have this split personality when it comes to it. I, I don't see that Republicans will be tied to Donald Trump in an off-year election, in a midterm election in Georgia, to the extent Democrats would like. If this was a presidential campaign year and Brian Kemp were running and Donald Trump were on the ballot, Stacey Abrams might be governor, but that's mm -hmm. not it. If even with, um, I mean, uh, do you anticipate the president coming down here? Do you anticipate, um, yeah. do you anticipate President Obama coming down here for Abrams? That's going to be an interesting question. I don't know that he does come for Abrams. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that Democrats have such a strong love of, of Barack Obama. We were talking about this on Meet the Press this past Sunday, that they have such a strong love of Barack Obama, they don't understand he also fires up Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, and Barack Obama comes to North Metro Atlanta. How many Republican voters who really aren't excited by this race, how many Kegel voters who aren't excited suddenly get excited to make sure that Barack Obama doesn't get a win in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, can Barack Obama fire up voters more for Stacey Abrams in Georgia than he fired them up for himself? 
All right. Do um, switching gears for just a second. What um, what are the big divides? And I mean, we saw a contentious primary that wasn't necessarily over steep ideological lines, mm -hmm. um, but um, but it was a very contentious primary in the Republican side. Um, what issues divide? What what div what caused that contentious primary? <laughs> and but also, what what are the greater divisions in Georgia Democratic politics, Georgia Republican politics today? Excuse me. So the big divide, you know, I remember having a conversation with one of uh, Cagle's aides about, you know, the other campaigns are really pushing, and it is something for you guys to consider that Casey Cagle has not won a straw poll in the state anywhere, and he says, well, you know, I always told Governor Deal that if if winners of straw polls became governors, we would have Governor Oxendine. And we got a good laugh out of that, it's a fair point, but there was clearly an underlying lack of trust for Casey Cagle among Republicans in the state. Uh, and it had everything to do with the fact that they there is this growing division, and it is, I think, the key division in the state of Georgia between the Chamber of Commerce Republican and your average Republican voter. The, and it, this transcends the Republican Party into the Democrats, and that there is even at the Democratic base level this sense that whatever the Chamber of Commerce wants, it gets. Whatever Georgia Power wants, it gets. And that's not necessarily what is good for small businesses. It's not what's good for taxpayers or, or voters. This has spilled over into a Republican Party primary where Casey Cagle was the Chamber of Commerce guy who was going to say all sorts of nice things to socially conservative voters about RIFRA. He was going to say all sorts of socially conservative and acceptable things about school choice and private education and, and vouchers and charter schools to the, the soccer moms who care about that issue. But ultimately, he was not going to support those issues. There was no trust. And people had a hard time articulating this because you put a reporter in their face with a microphone. It's like, well, what did he betray you on? And they're like, uh, I'm pretty sure he stabbed us in the back on the free the beer issue. Well, what evidence do you have? Well, I don't know. I just think that. What about Riffer? Well, I'm pretty sure. Well, what evidence? Yeah, I don't know. Well, now suddenly Clay Tippins comes along and gets him recorded mm -hmm. saying all the things these people believed to begin with. And suddenly, here's your proof, AJC, that he's stabbing me in the back behind the scenes, behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, he had a trust issue. The Kemp people, I think it's largely self-preservation. They got to have a job later in politics and they blew a race with a massive amount of money. They're trying to say, oh, it was Donald Trump who pushed Brian Kemp over the finish line. We, we know the early voting results in Georgia. Donald Trump endorsed Brian Kemp two days before early voting ended, and Brian Kemp had 60% of the early vote, 56.7% of the early vote. Uh, he won early voting. Uh, for Kemp to say, oh, well, we were going we to crush him on election day. No, I, I actually know the vendors for Cagle and Kemp for their door-to-door -door online programming. And the Kemp door-to-door -door campaign behind the scenes was breaking every record his company the, the vendor he used, breaking every internal company record that company had. Hmm. Nothing like that with the Cagle campaign door to door. Kemp was going to win without the president's endorsement. It's convenient for them to be able to say on the on the Cagle side that it wasn't going to happen. Uh, and you're proving a, a negative to a degree there. But look at early voting. He wasn't going to win. And it was all Clay Tippins' trust issues. He mm -hmm. found a way to give voters in the Republican Party the evidence they needed to confirm why they didn't trust Cagle. Why did you pick Brian Kemp? The trust issue. Yeah. Uh, I, I did not trust Cagle. Um, mm -hmm. I knew enough behind the scenes, for example, on my radio show pushing the, the beer issue, allow craft beer brewers in Georgia to sell directly to customers, that Cagle was the chief impediment in the Senate on that. Uh, he was the chief impediment on RIFRA until he needed it to pass and knowing Governor Deal would veto it. Uh, and time and time again, these issues that I care about, Cagle was ultimately the obstacle. And then there was the school choice issue. I knew about that one as well, that I support the school scholarship program. I give money to it. Uh, and that he is an, an obstacle to it. Uh, I had a real hard time trusting him. And then honestly, I hate to say this because I, I don't mean it. There's nothing he can do to overcome it. But he was just too politician. I mean, I interview a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I interview a ton of people every year. And rarely do you come across a politician who is that smooth of a politician. And those tend to be the ones I don't trust. Right. Um, what about the other side? How did, how did, um, how did Abrams uh, beat Evans as, hard, as, bad, as badly as she did? Because she show, sewed up so much. It's really, really hard to say. Sewed, sewed up. up. Yeah. <laughs> she, she showed up 
uh, sewed up a lot of national democratic support for money. Mm -hmm. She had laid the groundwork, I think. I mean, you know better than me, but she she laid a lot of groundwork early on on this uh, voter drive effort. It looked like she cared. She convinced a lot of national Democrats that she was the one. It's kind of funny. I had several progressive activists I know in the state reach out to me early on and said, man, you've got to write about this woman. She is a con artist. We're going to be toast. You just we, we need to expose her. Maybe you can expose her for us. And uh, the, the, the National Democratic Party loves identity politics. The idea of having a, a black female governor of Georgia was just too good to pass up. You mm-hmm. know, they poured a ton of money into the state and largely shut out Stacey Evans, who I think could be giving the Republicans a run for their money. Gotcha. What to that to that last part, what um are there members of the uh, on are there people on the Georgia Democratic bench that um, worry um, conservative activists and and or establishment Republicans? Now that Stacey say? Evans is beaten, not so much. Right. Um, she was she was one who worried them behind the scenes in these meetings. Mm-hmm. She was one of them. Um, there are not otherwise right now. I don't know that Democrats have anyone. Scott Holcomb, perhaps, mm-hmm. uh, in the state legislature, is one that has an intriguing resume. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, no, even even the slate of candidates running in these other statewide offices, whether it's John Barrow or some of these others, they don't really worry Republicans. Um, no one is really worried about uh, Karen Handel being beaten by her Democratic opponent mm-hmm. um, because of the gun issue. Right. Uh, no one is really worried, ultimately, I mean, I know a few because of the polling, but at the state party level, no one seems to really be worried about Stacey Abrams because of her progressive positions that Mm -hmm. ultimately these candidates drive independent voters back to the Republican Party. Do, um, are, uh, what about the Republicans? I mean, who, who's, who's on the bench that, that, um, excites conservatives and can maybe Mm. keep some of the establishment money to be able to afford to run statewide? Right. Um, you know, you got several of the congressmen, Every, there were so many people who expected a Tom Price or a Lynn Westmoreland to run for governor mm-hmm. and shock that they didn't. Uh, but Westmoreland is still someone who has some clout. Um, you've got, um, oh, who's the congressman up in northeast Georgia? Uh, not Tom Graves, um, although Tom, Tom Graves is one. Um, Collins. Yes, Doug Collins is one. I always forget his name. Uh, and then there's Karen Handel as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a there are a lot of people who think that these can be after Kemp is finished mm-hmm. an, another person or you know there's John Kennedy in the state Senate uh, mm-hmm. from Middle Georgia who the chamber likes the guy the evangelicals like the guy he, he's very he well liked at home too yes mm-hmm. uh, and you've got a number you've got this deep bench on the Republican side that I don't know that you really do on the Democratic side in Georgia mm-hmm. the um do um. Is there, I mean, if they're, given everything that you've said, I mean, is there, is there a possibility for a quote unquote blue wave in Georgia? I mean, there is, but if you look at the massive blue wave nationwide in 2006, mm-hmm. uh, it kind of went around Georgia. And I, I and my sense is that that's going to happen this time. The Republicans will be further away from a supermajority in the legislature than they've been in a while. But I don't see them being able to pick off the statewide races in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you'll see some Republicans lose more than lost in 2006 because of the demographic changes in the Atlanta area. But I don't think you'll see them lose power. Uh, I've said for a while I really thought that 2022 would be about when Democrats became competitive. And I think the, the Achilles heel for the Republican Party in Georgia is when you look at Republicans in Wisconsin, which is actually a blue state, not a red state. When you look at Republicans in Texas, where it's a solidly red state, but they know the demographics are long-term changing, you've got Republican parties that are trying to come up with policies that they can show minority voters these work to your benefit too. And I don't see that we have that in Georgia. I don't see that we have a Republican party making the case that the policies we've advanced are different from when we had a D next to our name Mm -hmm. and are different in that they give you more benefit than those policies we used to support. Can you do that with the president at the top of the ticket or the president lingering over? That's a good question. I I don't know that you can. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that Donald Trump, Barack Obama wiped out the Democratic Party, set them back to the late 1894, I think. We have to go to find as few Democrats in elected office as possible. 
I do think the Republican Party has largely become the majority party in the country. And I realize a lot of people don't think that. It doesn't come up in the media. But even in this blue wave, no one is talking about a wipeout of Republicans at the state and local level nationwide. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's because Republic, a lot of the issues I think Republicans are dealing with now are they are a majority party that requires them to build coalitions. The Democrats can go more progressive because they're much more a minority party now tied to an ideology in the way conservatives were in the 1980s, where they could win the presidency, but they couldn't win dog catcher in Dubuque. Mm-hmm. What, what issues um, here at home in the Republican Party are um, splitting the Republican Party and are just internal debates? I know mm-hmm. the religious freedoms yeah. uh, conversation. Religious freedoms, ones. Amazon. Right. Uh, how much money should the state give? You've talked to a extensively company. about Amazon. Yes. Mm-hmm. How much money should the state give taxpayer monies to an existing corporation that would love to eat every other small business in Georgia up? Uh, why should we be spending those taxpayer dollars attracting them to come into the state to compete with existing businesses? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, and I think uh, privately there are even a lot of Republicans in the legislature who think that the uh, deal has gone too far. They don't have the, the means to stop him, but there's some concern there. There's a demographic concern that if you actually delve into the Amazon proposal, they're not going to be hiring a ton of Georgians. They're going to be bringing people into the state. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're worried about the state trending blue, do you want a massive corporation bringing a bunch of Seattle hipsters into the metro Atlanta area, tying mm-hmm. up traffic and everything else? Probably not. Um, it, it is the, what is Georgia doing with our tax dollars to in, attract business to the state as opposed to building up businesses already in the state is a big issue within the Republican Party. Mm-hmm. Education is another huge issue in the party. The private school scholarship that got Casey into trouble, uh, charter schools, school vouchers, school choice, Those are really becoming issues, and there is as much in the Democratic Party as in the Republican Party an urban-rural divide. Mm -hmm. A lot of the rural Georgia Republican legislators really do think that they essentially are in service to Atlanta, and that is a that's a divide that I think could rock both parties in the next ten years in Georgia. That seemed to play out strongly in the um, in the Republican primary runoff. Yeah. That that. Kemp really consolidated a lot of rural support early, mm-hmm. and um, I mean, I think his his opening ad was against Atlanta. Yeah, I mean, it was it was I a long form internet ad, but it was about Atlanta. You talk to Republicans, and the phrase Gainesville Mafia comes up in almost every single conversation uh, between Nathan Deal and Chris Riley and Casey Cagle. There is this view that this area around Gainesville, Georgia, has dominated Republican politics. That, I mean, I've talked to so many people who said, man, if people just sent investigators from the AJC up there and filed Open Records Act requests, they could take down Nathan Deal. And and these are Republicans saying this. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's this view that they have essentially consolidated power in one area of the state at the expense of everyone else. And Kemp, to his credit, in the primary, going door to door to these farms in South Georgia, made that case that we're beholden to Gainesville and Atlanta and, and we're not able to deal with the stuff ourselves. We're being left behind. Georgia, I mean, modern political history is so tied up with regional epicenters of power. I mean, you mm-hmm. had, I mean, well, young Harris being the exception, there's not right. enough really there for a yeah. power center. But, uh, but I mean, Marietta mm-hmm. after young Harris, after, after Zell and then, and then Houston County. I mean, mm-hmm. goodness gracious, the power that came out yeah, of there. Yeah, Walker, Purdue, all that. Yeah. Abs- and so, I mean, what, what happens without it? I mean, what ha- happens when you have, you know, a speaker of the house from Blue Ridge and a, um, and uh, a governor from Athens or Atlanta mm-hmm. or a governor for a lieutenant governor from Atlanta or I don't remember where Jeff Duncan's from. He's from Forsyth County. Forsyth County. County that's Forsyth right. Forsyth County. I mean, it's yeah. not. There's no epicenter at this point. Right. There's or, not. Uh, and they're going to have to be really mindful of that fact. And I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how much longer Ralston stays, mm-hmm. but they're going to have to be very mindful of that. Does the president pro tem of the Senate, if it's a, if it's a John Kennedy from Middle Georgia, that may mm-hmm. be able to balance some of that out. Oh, that's right. Um, but there's still a little Hall County yeah, in, because it, Butch Miller's there still. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But you do have this North Georgia above I-20 when, well, that's where the population is, but land-wise, there are a lot of people south of I-20 that are going to feel like they're ignored, and Republicans are going to have to figure out how to address that. You said you said it plays out. I mean, what, do you, what hypothetically, how does the Atlanta versus Georgia is how it's coined right. off, and how does how does that play out moving forward? Oh, I, I think what you begin to see are much more intraparty fighting within the state legislature. Um, mm-hmm. You're going to see a lot of these House and Senate Republicans south of I-20 
uh, cobbling together a caucus of their own to make demands and, and hijack legislation moving forward. What um what in particular? I mean, what fight? I mean, I'm sure transportation is the first one that comes. Yeah, to transportation, mind. rural broadband. Right. Um, you're probably going to have budgetary bills. I mean, how much is going to services in rural South Georgia? Uh, one of the other things I think you're going to start seeing is some real serious discussion about consolidation of counties in the state. Mm -hmm. Do um, what about? Um, Medicaid expansion with the rural hospital yeah, that's, closures. That is going to be a real big one. I, it would not surprise me if Republicans cave on that issue, but structure it in such a way that they can say it's not a cave. Do you, I mean, what do you expect being with your, you know, finger on the pulse of the um, conservative base in Georgia? I mean, will, you know. It's going to be a huge fight. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know that Brian Kemp, assuming he becomes governor, will have the ability to veto or the ability to not veto anything that expands Medicaid. The, the Republican Party is so tied to killing Obamacare that mm -hmm. if anything comes out that is perceived to be Obamacare, he's going to have to veto it. So there's no the argument in your mind that um, the further we get away from President Obama actually being president, that it becomes more politically viable to expand Medicaid. I mean, do you if, think if President Trump and the Republicans are somehow in the next year able to carve out some wiggle room, then yeah, they can do it. But if they can't, then it's still Obamacare in Republican voters' mind. What's um, so what's the with all that in mind? What I mean, what is the future of the Republican Party in Georgia? What what's the trajectory? I mean, it's you know after mm. this long election cycle, you know where you said you're looking towards. Um, you think there might be competitive parity with, with right. the Democrats in 2022. I mean, what, what, does the, what does the Republican Party in Georgia have to do looking towards that era of competition to prepare for it? And what are they going to do? They're going to have to work very hard to get Hispanic voters into the Republican Party. You know, long term, demographically, um, the longer Hispanic family stays in the United States, the more they identify as white and Republican. It's one thing that Republican anti-immigration activists don't pay attention to. They're so convinced Democrats want to they want to bring in Hispanics and steal the vote. Well, you know, the longer they're here, they vote for you. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have to start working on a coalition of, of Hispanic um, voters in the state. Uh, it would be wise for the next Republican governor to increase dramatically the number of Hispanic judges on the bench in the state mm -hmm. and tie them to the Republican Party. Uh, it would be very, very good for the Republicans to come up with some sort of immigration compromise in the state. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they're ever going to get black voters in meaningful numbers in the state, but if they can build a coalition with Hispanic voters, they can last longer. Uh, and the social conservative issues play well with Hispanic voters. I mean, if you look at Texas in, in the Wendy Davis Greg Abbott race, uh, I, I coined the phrase, started calling her abortion Barbie. Right. And I did so because there was polling in Texas that Hispanic voters 18 to 21 would not vote for a politician where abortion was their number one issue. Mm -hmm. and well, what's Beto's nickname? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and it, it, I need to come up with something, I guess. Right. But it, it, was, it, it was a really striking that even 18 to 21-year-old Hispanic voters are socially conservative. And as you have Atlanta, and really Atlanta even more so than Athens, seeming to be pushing at the city level a progressive agenda, uh, it is a way for Republicans to attract Hispanic voters to their party. Do can they though with the lingering of Donald Trump and the and the? Oh, and they they can't because they got a bunch of dumbasses in the Republican Party in Georgia who say stupid shit all the time to turn off minority voters. Right. Um, uh, until they're willing to sit down and, and educate themselves on what not to say to piss off minority voters, I, I don't know that they can. But you know, Brian Kemp with his good old boy round them all up image may be the guy to do it. Mm -hmm. The um. But yeah, having Donald Trump linger over the party is is not good at that aspect. Right. The um. Uh, well, what we'll just round it out. What's next for you? What I mean, what what are you doing now? Oh gosh, more radio. I hope I, I'm trying to do a national radio show. And your show to just my expanded, local show. right? Is or is expanding? I've well, read somewhere it, it's going to no, be still playing it, in Macon. Potentially, um, I'm I'm in talks to do a national show starting okay. in January. I don't know that I, it'll come to fruition, um, but I mean, my radio show right now is it's the largest local talk station anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. WSB is the largest talk station in the country. And 
I try to more so than I think a lot of local hosts do spend a lot of time on our legislature and what's going on uh, and talking about legislation and trying to get people to be active. Um, I've got this great technology I use on my show where people can, while they're stuck in their car, text a word to a number and immediately be able to call or email or Facebook or tweet their state legislator or the governor. Um, and just still trying to, to do that. I have always been, my heart has always been with political activism. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that a lot of radio does. And it, it, radio itself is going through this profound change because December 31st of this year will be the last time baby boomers are in the demo for radio advertisers. Wow. So suddenly you're going to have Gen X and millennials and that's where I am. And so how do you relate to those people? Well, you relate to them not by b having the partisan panels that Sean Hannity does where everyone screams at each other, but by building a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. and, and they tend to last, uh, tend to linger in radio. So that's the future of it. It's not the model is you're moving toward more towards that and less away from the traditional model of the, of the limbo model. And Yeah, I think so. And, you know, Rush is a dear friend. And right. I love the guy and, and he is still the best in the business. But I definitely think radio is beginning a transition where if you're going to keep your audience, you've got to be much more relational. You can't be the abstract distant voice. And I think that's where what I've done with the resurgent in this conference plays perfectly into radio. You will you'll be able to come hang out with me for two days, three days, mm -hmm. every year in person somewhere in the country and mm -hmm. and integrate that all into one comprehensive package. Cool. Um, I have just one question out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, how do you explain the, and I've, I've always wanted to ask somebody in your business this, mm -hmm. the um, rise of right-wing conspiracy thought, thought, talk radio, the, the info wars, <laughs> and, and what's the future in that, of, of that moving forward? You know, Donald Rumsfeld and I were in a, at an exhibit one time in Washington. He had sol shoulder surgery. Keith Urban, who was his right-hand man, couldn't be there to help him. And a friend of mine worked with him and asked me to come. And we we're walking around, and he's, he's got stories. I forget the name of the portrait photographer, but these portraits go back to the late 40s, and he knows all of these people. And he's pointing them out. Bella Habzug, he has a story on. Um, he's got a story on Reagan. He's got a story on Jimmy Carter. He's got a story on Rosalind. It's just, it's all funny. Mm -hmm. And at one point, he, I forget who he's pointing. It might have been Kissinger. He's pointing to, and he's talking about all the crazy conspiracy theories about Kissinger. And then he mentions his time. He was dealing with the, the Kennedy assassination. And he was involved in some way with Ford and the Warren Commission. And he says, you know, I, I've concluded there's no such thing as a conspiracy because nobody can keep a secret. Um, and, but then he says, a lot of people, you know, they want to blame a conspiracy because otherwise they might have to blame themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that lingered with me. And I, I do have the sense that there are a lot of people who have come up with conspiracies for the way things work because, and I know people get mad at me when I say this, but people fail at life. They make bad decisions and they, they get the losing end of stuff and mm -hmm. they don't want to take responsibility for it. So it must be some hidden hand that is out to get them. Mm -hmm. And that has festered a, a while and there's been so much publicity on the Republican side and with Alex Jones, people miss it's happening on the Democratic side too. The 57% mm -hmm. of Democrats who believe the Russians physically changed votes in ballot boxes in 2016. Uh, and largely I think it is because People have this sense that Washington, D.C. Uh, makes promises to them and breaks them, and so there must be someone they're answering to, as opposed to they're all incompetent and corrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's easier to believe that Washington doesn't function because there's a hidden hand steering it than Washington doesn't function because you've elected a bunch of idiots. Mm -hmm. uh, because then that becomes you. You've, you've elected the idiot. It's your fault. It's, <laughs> um, and I think the, the best way to get rid of the conspiracy theorism is to actually go back to this idea that Washington should be very limited in what it does. I don't know that we'll ever get there, and that's the problem. Um, both sides seem to want Washington to take care of us. And, and I understand the social aspect on the Democratic side of, of the country so big, you need Washington doing this. But unless we're willing to let people in California have abortion and gay marriage and, and have universal health care and people in Georgia not, and just agree to disagree on this stuff and not have Washington do everything, we're going to continue to have conspiracies. Uh, we're going to continue to have people who believe there's some malevolent force screwing with them as opposed to their electing idiots 
who go to Washington and don't know what they're doing. Um, I really do think as a nation, we have got to get back to letting local communities solve their problems and have people rely on their churches and their local government and not on Washington. Um, because once you begin to rely on Washington, you don't see what's going on and it becomes really easy to believe there's a sinister mm -hmm. force at hand. Alex Jones has made money off of that. And it's crazy to think this guy was a, a liberal public interest, public access TV show host in Texas, but realized he could get conspiracy theorists uh, to mm -hmm. pay the bills for him. And there are people who buy that. There, there's another aspect of this, though, and I feel more and more strongly about this the longer I've thought about it. If you go back in history, there have always been Gnostic movements, and they became very, very centered around the Christian church early on uh, in that they weren't telling you everything. There had to be more to it. It seemed so simple. All you got to do is believe in this guy and get eternal life. No, there's got to be something more to it. Right. And the Gnostics were able to attract a crowd. And as more people, particularly on the left, take this view that these are unacceptable things for us to talk about in society, you're going to be able to have more people make money off the idea that, oh, they don't want you to know the truth. Pay me and I'll give you the truth. Whether it's white supremacists or the, the Sandy Hook conspiracy theorists, um, shutting people out of conversation as, a, as opposed to responding to their thoughts. There's always a, a and it, going back thousands of years, there's a segment of the population that believes there must be more to it than that. And mm -hmm. they're willing to pay someone to give them that truth. Uh, it, it, like, for example, I, I'm, I'm not a big believer in this whole idea that uh, white people have a higher IQ than black people. Um, the, the, the bell curve thing. If you actually delve into his book and you delve into what's the, what's the big atheist guy, Sam Harris and others. Sure. Um, that there are genetic separations between the races that ultimately don't amount to much. Um, but if you're not willing to say that, yes, there are genetic differences between this, but ultimately they don't amount to anything. That was um, Andrew Sullivan's argument. Yes, was, he, and I think mm -hmm. he, he made a great argument about it, that, that Ezra Klein and others said, we can't even say this part of it, mm -hmm. even though it's followed by it doesn't amount to anything. Um, well, then you're suddenly giving someone a platform to say, hey, they don't want you to know the secret hidden truth about the races. Right. Come, come hear why white supremacy is a great thing and when it's all bullshit. Um, you're, you're going to have people sell this level of Gnosticism. Uh, and the Internet makes it easier to access the people who are looking for that because mm -hmm. everyone's convinced that someone's hiding something from them. And you can make money off of right. convincing. That's a dangerous game. And, but, you know, to be fair, it's not just the left anymore on college campuses and left-wing activists who are saying, don't hear this. It's you got people, I mean, you got the president of the United States today saying it's not true thousands of people died in, in Puerto Rico. Only 18 people died. Listen to me for the truth. Mm -hmm. And you got a lot of people who are going to suddenly believe that all these dead people don't actually exist. But that, that's a, I mean, to, to um, I know I said I want to round out, but that you just touched on something really important. The, the, um, where does a, a person who works in opinion media like you do, um, how do they operate in this new era of oh. distrust in, of the media and, and how much of that is founded, how much is it unfounded? It's so hard. Um, I can tell you what I've done. Right. I, I and then we'll cut believe, it after that. I'm okay. sorry. No, no, no. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't believe Donald Trump was going to win. And I wrote that even if he was going to win, I wasn't going to vote for him. Mm -hmm. I had... People show up at my house to threaten me and my family. My kids got threatened in the grocery store. They got run home from school one day by other kids saying their mom and daddy said I was going to get killed. And all. It was it was a, a really shitty election season. Uh, and I decided he did win. And I was wrong. And my position ever since has been that my number one job on radio and at the resurgence should be to tell you what is happening. Here are the facts. And then beyond the facts, here's what I think about the facts. Mm -hmm. But we should be able to start with the objective facts. Here, objectively, is what has happened. And even that is hard now with, like, the Mueller investigation. Sean Hannity pays some investigative journalist to say crazy shit on uh, TV, and everybody, oh, this, this must be true. Well, how do you know? I mean, you don't know that this person knows what they're talking about. And everyone boxes into their tribal issues. The Democrats have the people they want us to do. The Republicans have theirs. My view is that I should be able to be the guy who calls bullshit on my own side and says, this is right, this is wrong. And if people don't like it, they can change the channel. And I've done that since the election and my ratings have gone up. Uh, they've in particular gone up with women. And that tells me that there are still a lot of people out there 
who really do want the truth. They don't want my party's version of the truth. They just want to know what the hell is happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, and frankly, now going to seminary and talking about faith a lot, I'm finding more and more there are a lot of people out there. They're not vocal. They're, they're not the ones showing up at rallies. But they're like, something's not right in the country. And who can I trust to kind of steer me through this? And I, I kind of think I am fell into being someone in that position to say, I, I'm a Republican. I think Donald Trump did this thing good. He, he was right here, but he's bad on all these other things. Uh, I like what his administration is doing, but I think he's a terrible character. Uh, and it's harder and harder to do that because you, people are convinced I've somehow gotten rich by doing this. I've lost 60% of my income in the last two years. Um, and, but I, I'm just, I've never been the guy to be the cheerleader. Even when mm-hmm. George Bush was president, I love the guy, mm-hmm. but I thought he was wrong and was willing to say it. The fact that so many people who cheered me on when I was saying it about Bush now think I need to shut the hell up says more about them than me. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Sure. Um, this is, um, this has been really, really great. And thank you for your, as you know, being from Macon, thank you for your time on city council. <laughs> oh my God. And all you did for Oh, Macon. we didn't even get into that. No, oh, we didn't. <laughs> God. Yes. That was awful. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for really, thank yeah, you for coming sure. and doing this. Happy to.